Welcome to Coffee House. Today we are looking at The Year of Magical Thinking by Joan Didion. We all experience grief for lost opportunities, lost friends, that salad that got away. Most recently, the only thing that I can talk about related to grief is when my ex moved out of state. This was someone I had been in love with my entire life. I can't remember a time when I wasn't, so it was very difficult to have that kind of deteriorate and disappear. So over the last couple of years now, I've been going through what is likely a fraction of what Joan Didion had to go through. And, and Joan Didion, of course, recently passed away. So I wanted to cover some of her work on here. And she had to experience some incredibly profound grief. And we all have different responses to it. For me, I had to just get out. I had to explore things intellectually and add some new experiences that put kind of what was going on in perspective. For Joan Didion, we will see, she had a very particular and intense reaction to grief and method for dealing with it. So this was a while ago, Joan Didion was just plunged into a vortex of grief, and the year of magical thinking is her candid exploration of it. So as always, we will have a look at the contents of the book, then we'll do an analysis to kind of talk about the quality of the book, and then we'll talk big picture to fold it in and try to get something actionable out of it. We will have a book incoming that I wrote, it's just a little fun thing, that explores some of the amateur writing out there when it comes to fiction, so have a look out for that. And there's a new series uh, about AI on the YouTube channel that's going to be going out very soon, so if you want to have a look at that, that'd be great. But otherwise, let's get into the contents. So, in the span of a handful of days, Didion's world would be completely upended. She sat down to dinner one day with her husband, and it was her husband of some 40 years. And she recounted this moment in detail, all the things that they did and what they said. He raised his arm in a particular way, and she looked at him and recalls thinking that it was just some kind of failed joke that he was attempting to make at the moment, and it turned out he was suffering a fatal heart attack, and he would, he would be dead pretty quickly. Just prior to this event, their daughter, Quintana, had been hospitalized with severe pneumonia, and it was so severe that it required being put into an induced coma. So then the year of magical thinking from what I could gather in the book was that she believed and held on to the idea that he would return. So she would do a lot of weirdly irrational things. And again, Joan Dinian has this, you know, journalistic writer's mind wherein she tries to take in all the information of the, the events that are happening around her and she will dive into it. So the magical thinking was that he would be returning at some point, and she found this uh, curious that she would be in this mode. So there were things like, um, she also couldn't help but think for a long time that there was something that could have been done by one or both of them that would have prevented his death. So the book then is an exploration of all the manifestations of her grief, all the things she did in response. So her reaction, she had this kind of childish thinking. She would resist giving clothes away. So his clothes, she wouldn't want to give those away. And his shoes in particular, she didn't want to get rid of those because she believed that he would be coming back to use them. And this is after he's dead, after it's been confirmed. And I'm sure a lot of people go through this exact same feeling. And things like organ donation. She didn't want to allow the the person who was coming to harvest. It seems like such a heartless term. I could have used a better adjective there. But she was resistant to the organ donation. She acted in all sorts of irrational ways. She kind of turned that super analytical mind. She turned to it and she would start exploring literature. She used a number of quotes, you know, from various poems and books about death and grief. So she would start exploring literature. She, she started reading all these studies. And this is not something that seems like a, a common response, but she would start reading all these studies about grief, what grief is, what it does to people, how people experience it, different reactions to it. She started researching medical procedures, so specific medical procedures that, like, Quintana was on the cusp of requiring, or things that the doctor would mention, like a tracheotomy. And Joan Didion would go into the details about these things. She would buy books and look up all the particulars of these procedures. And she went through a phase of just, she talked about all these memories that would come flooding back. So these times when, like, her husband John, who had passed away, flew in from L.A. just for dinner. He would, he would take a flight in just so they could have dinner and then fly back. It was on this uh, PSA airline, apparently it was called. But it had stewardesses and pink miniskirts. And it was running until one of them crashed and killed all the passengers. And then it went defunct. So this, these are just details that would come out of this time that would show up that she would remember about her husband. 
And one thing she also talked about, which is really interesting, was the Western attitudes toward death and kind of the posture that people have toward death and how it differs culturally. So something about death is that for thousands of years, if not many more, through our history, death was so familiar. It was something that was so close. It was something that happened so often. You know, there's a high mortality when it came to infants. Uh, people didn't live much past 30. So your children, extended family, would often die. There would be wars where they weren't just far off wars that you'd hear about, you know, through the news. These are like the uh, much closer tribal wars or wars that would really affect you and your, your family. So death was a really close companion throughout that time, so you had a different relationship to it. But now it kind of disappears. It's something that's kind of pushed to the side, and mourning itself seems like a morbid self-indulgence, and it's kind of discouraged. But so mourning in general be discouraged, and it wasn't as present in our day-to-day -day lives. So for her, it was on December 25th when her daughter, Quintana, when their daughter, Quintana, was hospitalized in the ICU with the, the very severe pneumonia. And then it was December 30th, so five days later, when John had his fatal heart attack. But then over the next two years, Quintana would have uh, all sorts of recurring medical issues. She'd be in and out of the ICU. There's one time where she just collapsed. I think it was at LAX, and she collapsed and hit her head. But so throughout this time, Didion would look up all the medical issues that came up. So things like a fixed pupil and what that means and what brain death was and what it would be like to, to experience the perpetual darkness that followed it. And there were other memories that, that arose because she would start going through John's things. So like his notes, he would keep all these notes about ideas because they were both writers. And this is something that's really fascinating. So there was this couple, Joe and Gertrude Black, and Didion was going through his notes and found notes about this couple, Joe and Gertrude Black. And he wrote all these notes about them that they were uh, really involved in service, like to the community. And they did all these other wonderful things and that he wanted... Joan and John, those two, to be more like Joe and Gertrude Black. And then she noticed, like, the date on the notes of it, and she thought back to the time, she realized that she was writing at the same time that he was, the same time that he was sitting in here alone, writing this thing. She was sitting in her room alone, writing something else. And they have this particular kind of situation because they both, for 40 years, they were married. And they both worked from home because they were both writers. So they were together 24 hours a day for 40 years. <laughs> 24 hours a day. They'd have trips and things. But that is a kind of uh, engagement you don't really see in any couple anywhere. And one thing that she said, she talks about how you can love others, but marriage is different. Marriage is memory. And marriage is time. So there's something very particular about the way that marriage affects you and affects your relationship and the way that it functions when it comes to human relationships as opposed to just being in love with somebody. So time really plays a, an important part of her understanding of the way this grief thing works. And that was another thing that she talked about is that over time, it's so weird how it dulls. And another idea about how, because they saw each other every day for 40 years and spent 24 hours together, and even your spouse that you don't see necessarily 24 hours a day or anything, when you see them every day, they don't really age to you. It's so gradual that you don't age in their eyes. And when she went and saw herself not through his eyes anymore, but through her own in the mirror, it was something like, it was weird to experience the fact that she had aged. Because with him, it was like, it was just stuck in some kind of weird time dilation where <laughs> neither of them really aged. So then she goes through a, a ton more medical research and finally comes to the conclusion, you know, this kind of reconciliation with her grief, that it was nothing that they did that caused what happened to John. On. She would go through and start questioning every choice that they made, everything they ate, everything they did, how often they exercised or didn't exercise or whatever. But she determined after the autopsy report, after having read the autopsy report, that they couldn't have saved him, whatever they did. That the fact was he just inherited a bad heart, and that was the reality of what had happened. <laughs> So this was something I started for some reason, and it took me a while to get through it, actually. I started it on the 1st of January. It was the first book I started reading this year. I'd finished the two biographies uh, that we did earlier in the year. And it was sad. <laughs> it was really sad, I remember. Because I had started it, and then I went to get breakfast somewhere. I just went to go pick it up. And I was sitting at, uh, like, the the station where you, get to, where you do your pickup while I was waiting for it to be ready. And this flock of crows just decided to perch itself right around my car, and one of them right on the sign that was for, like, the carryout order. 
and I've always associated, since I was a kid, I've always associated crows with death. And I just happened to be reading this book that's specifically about that. It was just one of those moments that was a bit surreal, a little too surreal. So leaving whatever <laughs> egocentric interpretations of the work that I can take, you know, obviously she went through just a tremendous amount of heartache and grief and just had to deal with it. There's a kind of rugged sadness uh, that is a through line here, but it's not really, it's not a depressive sadness, you know? She is so capable and interested in things that it was different. So anyway, I want to go into the analysis. That was a bit of analysis, but we'll go into it formally here. There's just something tremendously matter-of-fact about this approach to death and grief. Everyone has to deal with grief to some degree. Didion had an interesting approach. She was so powerfully interested in every detail about it. I mean, it could be a simple cope, you know, a distraction. Everybody tries to distract themselves from something that's bad. And distractions can come from many places. But it seemed like there was something else that was churning in the background uh, related to her profession and, and what she was as a person, apart from just trying to distract herself from the realization of what was happening. You know, there's something just investigatory in her nature. She dived so deeply into every detail. One reviewer, I think in the New York Times, talked about how her writing in this book was like Hemingway. It was Hemingway-esque. And that there were a few adjectives. It wasn't a whole bunch of flowery descriptions. You know, the, it would be really easy to fall into that if you were trying to write about this kind of a topic. To use a lot of adjectives, <laughs> to use a lot of highfalutin language to try to talk about it. But there's this kind of iron straightforwardness. It's almost an abusive treatment of her own grief. Like she was self-flagellating in being so coarse about the way that she treated it. And it could be just a matter of uh, that's her personality and that's how she writes. And so it doesn't matter what the topic is. That's how she does it. But that's kind of what it seemed like only having read this and a handful of her essays. So there was a quote that was used actually in the Times article that I think really expressed the way that the book was written. And so I'll give you the quote here. Quote, I had entered at the moment it happened a kind of shock in which the only thought I allowed myself was that there must be certain things I needed to do. There had been certain things I needed to do while the ambulance crew was in the living room. I had needed, for example, to get a copy of John's medical summary so I could take it with me to the hospital. I had needed, for example, to bank the fire because I would be leaving it. There had been certain things I had needed to do at the hospital. I had needed, for example, to stand in line. I had needed, for example, to focus on the bed with the telemetry he would need for the transfer to Columbia Presbyterian, end quote. So she's got this kind of distance from this here because she's analyzing what her analysis was at the time. But you see how matter of fact it is. You see how much her brain is just trying to digest and move forward with the situation. So I'm not sure how comforting or helpful to people suffering from grief this kind of a book will be. I think this is really particular to Joan Didion, except for the fact of not wanting to give away their things. I'm sure that's something that everybody goes through. You know, that's something in my very meager way i didn't want to part with kind of the pictures and things that w we had together that i hadn't looked at in our entire relationship <laughs> you know six and a half years together i don't think i had once looked at one of our pictures that we took together but so that was something that i just couldn't part with i couldn't delete them for a long time i just kept looking at them over and over again so for her to have something so much more profound and having lived with this person for 24 hours a day for 40 years that's an entire lifetime that's a generation a couple generations worth of living together and getting to know somebody and spending time together, knowing somebody so tremendously well, being able to anticipate what they would do or say or think in a particular situation. And she mentioned that too, just having the urge to tell him about something. You know, when it came up, she used to do that all the time. Just something would come up in her writing or she was researching or in the news and she would want to run to him and say, oh, did you hear about this? What about that? And they would discuss it. But to have that for so long and for it to be gone so suddenly and in the midst, midst of something that was terrible happening anyway, it's just unbelievable that human beings have the wherewithal to be able to get through it. And throughout, you know, she cites studies and she kind of treats it academically and journalistically to try to understand grief. And that could help a lot of people, but I'm, I'm not sure. It's, you know, it's not teddy bears and comforting words going through this thing. But it's not sad or depressive either. She's not just resigned and destroyed by this thing. You know, there's something else to it. So moving on to the big picture, the big question that always occurs to me is, did any of it matter? 
and I'm sorry, this is going to get uh, personal. <laughs> I know generally I try to keep this as broad as humanly possible so we can apply it as much as humanly possible. But uh, about a decade ago, my father returned for a very short period. He had left when I was a kid and he came back. And he took my brother and I to see an aunt that we had never met before. And it was right before she was going to stop this treatment that was keeping her alive. So I remember standing next to my brother in this room with a bunch of people that I didn't know and had never met. And this woman there in the center and she was... Uh, I think she was covered she had a blanket over her lap and she was talking about how she didn't want to keep the treatment up and she didn't care if she died and my father's trying to convince her you know some religious precept and it was so weird how that situation contrasts like I remember the moment and I remember the situation but I never knew anything else about this person you know I, I can assume that she passed away after she stopped the treatment but I never talked to her again or any of her family I didn't even see my father again after that so it was a very different situation I mean, that's a pure contrast to what Joan Dinian had to go through, where she was so connected to somebody that passed away. I mean, sometime later, I would encounter, you know, the girl who I dated for a while there. And the thing was, I grew up with their family. And the only person that I truly respected, the only man that I really respected as a human being and looked up to was her grandfather. And he was somebody who I got to do a trip with, you know, down to Mexico. And it was one of my favorite of all time when I was a kid. And he came to my graduation. I got to see them at my graduation. And there was just something, there was this one moment that was so resonant to me. And it's still like, I don't know why it affects me so much to this day uh, we were driving into mexico and there was this like back road and we were in their suv he and his wife and she this another part of it is that she was not doing well when her and i broke up and she was giving me updates on a regular basis, but then she stopped giving me updates, you know. Um, and if you're a man, I'm just going to say this right now, make sure that it's established and something we need to establish with all the other men in the world. It's always your fault. It, and I'm not saying that hyperbolically. I'm not saying that as a joke or anything like that. It is always your fault when these relationships don't work out, when something goes wrong in these things. It's 100% always your fault. But so I didn't get any more updates related to, uh, you know, her grandmother, who I absolutely adored. But when we were driving through this back road, I remember we there were these guys, uh, just a group of guys who had a bunch of machine guns. They all had AK-47s, um, from what I recall. And they were standing in, on this road in this backwoods of no, well, it mountains. It wasn't woods. It was just mountains all over the place in desert. They were all standing with AK-47s. They only spoke Spanish. And it was away into Mexico. And her grandmother grandfather, she wasn't on the trip, but her grandfather quietly and calmly walked to the back of the SUV. He pulled out a case of Pepsi and he gave it to them just uh, like as a gesture on the way into Mexico. It was just a nice thing. They were in the middle of nowhere. It was insanely hot. He gave them this case of Pepsi. We got back in the SUV and drove away. It was just one of the things, it was one of those images and one of those events that was so amazing. And this man, you know, he supported his wife his entire life. He supported his grandkids his entire life. When I met with her again, you know, when I was back home and she was back home uh, to go to his funeral, I was there for a wedding and we just connected and uh, would end up you know spending six and a half years together and living together it was the first person I, I really lived together with and so the thing was and it has for you know a long time ever since is that this man he's not there anymore you know he's not off in the background doing something he's not supporting his wife He's not being there for his grandkids, and it's through no fault of his own. It's, it's not something that he did. He didn't do anything wrong. But it, it would just keep hitting me repeatedly, you know, on a regular basis that he's just, he's not there anymore. And what's, what's the point of it? Is it that important that he was able to echo in all these people's lives, including mine? And of course, it would be just incredible hubris to say that it's not important. It's insanely important to me in my little, you know, corner of the universe. But it's it's that great gift and great tragedy of being human that we are so adaptable that we can get over things. The pain, however acute, will eventually dissipate. And sometimes it feels like it suggests it wasn't so important in the first place. Luckily for me, uh, while the, the pain over the relationship having failed, while that has dissipated, you know, I don't feel that so acutely anymore. I miss her. I miss her terribly because she's just a, an incredible person. And it was absolutely my fault. But the pain over this guy, the one guy that I truly respected, that hasn't dissipated. That hasn't abated at all. So it's kind of reassuring. 
But anyway, okay, so that was <laughs> that was Coffee House. I appreciate uh, everybody listening, and we wish a fond farewell to Joan Didion and appreciation for all the work that she put in. But thank you very much. I will uh, I will hopefully see you on the next one. All right, bye.